to another edition of the Compliance Guy. As always, I want to say thank you so much to each and every single one of you for logging on, tuning in, and just hanging out with me and my special guests for a little while. And today, I'm excited because I get to welcome back two friends. One of them's uh, one of my very best friends, Robert Lyle, who is the managing partner of Lyle's Parker out of Washington, D.C., and Paul Weidenfeld, who is the managing director of Exclusion Screen. Um, today, we're going to talk about <clears throat> situations that are critical, not only from a compliance standpoint, but from a what is actually a reportable event standpoint with the Office of Inspector General. And I think from my experience in working with large integrated delivery health systems all the way down to the solo practitioners, I think there's a miss perception and oftentimes a misunderstanding for what the entity's actual roles and responsibilities are as it pertains to exclusion screening of not only your employees, but the vendors that you participate with. And getting into utilizing programs like the SAM or the LEIE, where you're getting raw data files and you could go through and spend hours trying to figure these things out. And then you get multiple hits because you have somebody with a similar name. Um, and I'll talk about some of these experiences because I'm actually going through something right now. Um, uh, I don't want to give too much of the information away, but with the Office of the Inspector General. Um, so today, my hopes are that we're going to be able to talk through a few different things. One, what is your responsibility under an OIG corporate compliance program versus what are your responsibilities under the state? Because there are significant variances between what is required federally versus what is required from a state perspective. I also want to talk about the different types of exclusions that can happen with the government. One is the permissive um, exclusion, and the other one is a mandatory exclusion. And I want to talk about the difference between those. And then <clears throat> we're going to get into talking about some of the most recent cases, because I think, again, a lot of folks talk about these and they say, well, who is it really that's getting excluded? Well, when you hear some of these stories and some of these cases, it may help you to understand why, if you're not doing it, you need to start doing it. So again, I want to welcome uh, uh, Robert Lyles and Paul Weidenfeld to the Compliance Guy. Gents, it's always good to see you. I hope you're uh, staying safe and healthy up there in uh, the District of Columbia. Yeah, it's always good to see you too, Sean. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, you don't want to say anything about that. Hey, Paul, you don't want to say anything about the District of Columbia, do you? Well, I, you know, <laughs> there's right. a lot going on these days. We had a visitor today from the Ukraine who addressed uh, Congress. We did. We yeah. did. Yeah. 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 It's always something. There's always something. And, you know, and, and you bring up a great point, and I, I, I do want to say this. Um, you know, to all of the people of the Ukraine, to all of the uh, people of Russia who are innocent bystanders in this whole mess, irrespective of what side of the aisle you sit on, um, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to each and every single one of y'all. I hope that this thing comes to a, a, a quick resolution and, you know, we can start to rebuild and move forward and, and kind of find a way for everybody to coexist without this uh, craziness that's been going on. But that's all I'm going to say about that uh, that situation. Uh, obviously, again, you know, there was a loss of life of Americans uh, that were over there as reporters, uh, videographers, uh, and those that lost their lives and or were severely injured. Obviously, um, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. And uh, again, let's just hope this thing comes to a quick resolution. So enough about that stuff, because uh, I don't want people yelling at me because they said that I'm. Um, being political and something um let's just kind of move on and and let's really talk about where exclusion screening started i think maybe getting a history of where this started why it's so important uh and give people a background on really what the damage is and and the um the cmps and and things of that nature uh they could potentially be facing for being in non-compliance uh, should I start, Paul? Okay. Well, uh, at the outset, 
it's important to remember that exclusion, this is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. The first, it was first uh, uh, brought into effect. The statute was, was, was first made effective in 1981. And at that time, Congress delegated the authority to assess CMPs to the secretary of HHS. She subsequently turned around, or he subsequently turned around, and, de and uh, further delegated that that authority to OIG. And there is, you know, through the Federal Register, through the, uh, the 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 rulemaking process. But but it's important to remember that, and I think this is so important to say it up front: screening for exclusions is not a not a check the box situation. There is a very real purpose in screening, and and that purpose, I like to think. You know, the government says if we're providing federal funds to some health care program, we don't want a single penny of these federal funds to go to someone, either through their salary or through their benefits, okay, or even overhead, okay, um, if that person has been excluded from participation. Right, Paul? Right. So what, what they've done is the, the position is if someone is excluded, they're deemed, as a matter of fact, whether we whether you agree or not, they are deemed to be to pose an unacceptable risk yep. to help to beneficiaries and to the federal fix. And, and, and that's what you hit on head. That's what it all comes down to. It's all about the patients, ultimately. Right. That's and right. It, so they're protecting the fund and they're protecting patients. That's true. The fund too. And yeah. and so we so they've identified these people. So what does it mean? to be excluded, it means that you cannot, as Robert just said, you just can't participate either directly or indirectly. And in effect, and we're talking about an OIG exclusion now in any federal health care benefit program, yes, CHIP, VA, any of them. What about, what about the- Retirement is funded by the state, correct? Yes. You know, FBH, what about, Medicare, what about Medicare. participation? What about participation? And I'm glad you, you said what you said, Paul, right? Which was, either directly or indirectly, right? right. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that I have for you, and I think our listeners have is, you know, what about if they're receiving funds from either a Medicare Advantage plan or a Medicaid, uh, 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 you know, managed care plan? Would those count as well because they are funds derived from the federal payer programs or from the state? Absolutely, absolutely. And the plans... The plans require any all, all of the plans. Um, they recently delegated the credentialing to the plans, and the plans themselves, with all of their providers, they have a contractual obligation to the plans, and the plans have an obligation to medic to CMS to ensure uh, screening. But but I would like to point out, Paul, and this is something that we talk about all the time: the obligation to screen is not statutorily based. Federally, there is no statute that says right. you must screen. The statute says if you hire someone that's excluded, you're going to pay the price. You're going to pay civil monetary penalties. You can be excluded yourself. You know, all these types of things. Now, but that doesn't mean that there aren't actual uh, requirements on the state side that the states may have passed themselves. So most of these requirements, frankly, are contractual in the sense that when you sign up as a participating provider, you know, you're swearing that you're you're not excluded and, and you haven't been excluded in a way that's going to prevent your participation. And to their credit, though, the, the advantage plans are some of the toughest when it comes to these issues. Well, the, so what's interesting is that, and as you said, Robert, so so there's no direct federal statute that says you, you must bring. However, right. at this time, Almost, it's over now. Forty percent of Medicare beneficiaries are on one of the plans on a, on a Medicare Advantage plan, uh -huh. and providers have to credential with the plans. And so they actually, in their contract with the plans, they they have an actual contractual obligation to screen. They yeah, they, and then, screen. now you're talking about the contract between CMS and the plans, and also talking about the contract between the providers and, and the and the plans. That's, That's right. right. So it goes all the way. So where it's another gotcha. so it's so they you know um, so there used to be this fiction on the CMS side, but with the with advantage they absolutely Medicare Advantage they absolutely have to screen they're required to and the Medicaid 
Medicaid is similarly, right? It's about, it's, it's, I don't know, it's like 60 or 70, I think it's like 70% now nationally. It's a Medicaid um, advantage. Well, they don't call them Medicaid advantage. They call them Medicaid, uh, the, the HMO side of it. And yeah, the, Medicaid, the MAOs. That's right. Those are like 70% of Medicaid and they all have that same. That's, that's for the future. Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't want to confuse everything because we probably ought to have a separate call sometime to talk about this. But on the Advantage plan side as well, you've got the whole new preclusion issue. Preclusions. Which, is, which addresses bad actors. That's a completely different requirement set. Okay. So let's that, don't confuse those two. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that. So, um, you know, again, when I read the statute, right, it, it, it doesn't say you must, but it says you know, the OIG would strongly advise that any individuals being brought into an organization are either run through the SAM or run through the LEI. And if not, there are potential consequences, uh, such as, you know, having to report, having to pay back money, having to uh, uh, attach a multiple on top of that, um, facing disciplinary action. Uh, by the government on top of that. So I, I think one of the questions, and I know it's kind of a, a, a silly question for me to ask because I know what the answer is going to be, is exclusion serious? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, it, 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 you, you did ask, we'll loop back for just a second because you asked sure. about the historical. And, and, yes. and Robert and I got in, involved in, in, in exclusion because we were representing someone back in 2013 when they issued, they had initial guidance back in the late 90s, which people thought you had a screen like once a year. Well, that's what the LYG used to used to say. Right. You know, in the in their 97 guidance, you know, the regulatory guidance in the Federal Register, you know, and that, that was what the rule used to be. In 2013, they issued guidance, new guidance, uh, and what they said was. If you don't, it, we will impose civil money penalties, and they have that authority, uh, if, you, if you contract with an excluded party or if you, if you hire an excluded party or if you submit any claims that are uh, someone who is excluded directly or indirectly contributes to. So the only way you could avoid that is by ensuring you don't have that is by screening. So they went to the screening obligation sort of around the bend. They do. Because they that's do. the only way you could avoid the civil money penalties, which was five, which is at that time was as much as $10,000 per claim, mm -hmm. plus all the claims were tainted. So that's how you, it's the only way to avoid those potential penalties. And, and, and to kind of take it back one more step, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you're you're a certified compliance officer, Sean, and, and you know, of course, seven elements of, of the uh, compliance plan. Uh, one of those elements now un under the revised uh, portion that was put together by by HCCCA and OIG, there is a one of those elements is screening. Now, they broke it out and gave it its own element. That is really how you kind of bootstrap these providers into it. You know, in addition to the, their contractual obligations. They're supposed to have, if you're a participating provider in Medicare and Medicaid, you're supposed to have a compliance plan, an effective compliance plan in place that follows those seven elements. One of the elements, one of those seven elements is screening. Now, to Paul's point, essentially, when OIG issued this guidance, what the effect of it was, was OIG was saying, as long as you're checking people when they first come in and every 30 days thereafter, we're not going to hit you with CMPs because we think you've got a a bona fide plan in place to prevent this. Right. But keep in mind, that doesn't mean that you can walk away from the overpayments because every one of those tainted claims, as Paul described them, is still an overpayment. So your best case scenario is you got an overpayment. Yeah. And I think one of the things also, and, and before I get into talking about the scope of an exclusion and who really can be excluded, um, you know, as I said just a few moments ago when we got started, you know, I have a case that I'm actually dealing with where I am appealing to the mm -hmm. Office of Inspector General. And this is an individual who, unfortunately, at a point in time in their life, they were struggling with substance abuse. They held a professional license. 
And rather than having their whole life exposed and going through investigations and all these different things, they said, look, I know I have a problem. I know I have to go get help. I am going to go before the board, the medical board in my state, and I'm going to voluntarily relinquish my professional license. Not understanding because this individual did not have legal representation. I think had this individual had legal representation, they may have had a different outcome on this thing. But this individual went before the board at one of their open hearings and said, I have a substance abuse problem. As such, I want to relinquish my license. I'm going to voluntarily enter into a rehabilitation program sponsored by the state. Okay? It was a state-sponsored program. And um, what she nor the medical board explained to her, uh, this individual was that this is a reportable offense, right? Even though it's not an offense, it's a reportable, it's a reportable yes. situation to the, office, right, to the Office of Inspector General. And the somebody at OIG got a hold of it and said, well, this is a person who voluntarily relinquished their license due to a substance abuse problem under the permissive exclusion. We're going to go ahead and boot them from the program. Well, the young, the, the, the young individual, while they were in rehab, received that letter um which came about a year after their exclude you know after they relinquished their license while they were in rehab and it said that they had x number of days to appeal well obviously this individual couldn't appeal because they were in a rehab and they lost their appeal rights so this appeal now was in place for 10 years okay and what people don't realize is even after 10 years, you have to reapply. You have to get this expunged or taken off of your record somehow. So, you know, let's talk about the scope of an exclusion because this is serious stuff. And, and it trickles down to, you know, not just the physician, it's physicians, it's non-physician practitioners, it's coders, managers, compliance professionals. Let's talk about the the fact that OIG under a special advisory, right? They updated a payment prohibition list to individuals who um, are excluded from participation. Do you guys want to guys want to tackle that and talk about some of these exclusions? Well, well, we're talking about the so the the different types of exclusion, the permissive versus mandatory, is is um, because we can. Should we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let's let's talk about the difference between mandatory versus a permissive exclusion. So, and by the way, Sean, I mean, well, so the, a mandatory exclusion, the, the effect of them is not that much different. It's how it's so the impact um, as they happen is not that much different. The mandatory exclusions are those in which the OIG is is really mandated as a matter of law. Whether they always do it is another question. But if you if there are there are three different four different levels of mandatory exclusions and one is there are if a healthcare fraud if you've committed healthcare fraud that's a mandatory exclusion and that's either a state or a federal healthcare fraud doesn't matter if you've been convicted of healthcare fraud you that's a mandatory exclusion if uh, patient abuse or neglect that's a mandatory exclusion certain drug offenses those those are uh, mandatory exclusions. And then there are certain others, um, uh, certain other criminal activity. So, so these are felony convictions mainly related to patient abuse, fraud, or drugs. As, and those are the mandatory. And the effect of a mandatory, Robert, is like five years. Minimum five it's years. A minimum, minimum of, five years. Minimum of five years. And the only, and on an appeal for a mandatory exclusion, as you just experienced. The old, the, you cannot appeal the underlying fact. Well, yours is a permissive, but it's the same thing. You can't appeal, you know, whether uh, the facts of the of the conviction or anything. Yeah, the all, predicate offense. All the predicate offense. Thank you. Robert. All you can appeal is the length of it That's in right. a mandatory exclusion. Permissive is permissive in the sense that the OIG seems to have some. Uh, they they don't have to it, uh, but. The main 90 over 95 percent of permissive exclusions are based on adverse license actions. 
Gotcha. And then, and now the minimum there is three years. The trick on the on the permissive side is that, as you know, you as you've said, you have to apply to get back in. The time if it's a three year permissive exclusion, three years are up, you're not back in. You have to apply. But here's the thing. In order, the OIG's regs say that in order for you to get back in, you have to resolve, if it's a licensing issue, you've got to resolve that licensing issue. You've got to go back to that board. That's really hard. It is. And and, and the sad thing is this individual does not want to be a clinician any longer. Yep. This individual simply wants to work in another administrative area. And the problem is they don't care. They okay. want well, this individual to still go back and get the licensure issue cleared up. Paul actually recently resolved a case very similar where, where a clinician was licensed in multiple states. He lost his license in, I believe it was Pennsylvania, and didn't want it back. Didn't want you know, that. but he was still properly licensed in another state where he wanted to practice. And Sean, if you will talk, and we can talk off record because there was a workaround that was acceptable. It was um, that we were able to do. Yeah, we negotiated with OIG. Well, and the negotiations was, was actually with the state, with the licensing board on the status. It was very. It's but it's very very difficult. And as you noticed, and as you said in the beginning, Robert. Talk, talk about how often you have seen people that end up in these situations, even when it's not when it's a very a minor. Um, oh, it's hard. Uh, a, yeah. a, a minor state offense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. We recently had a case where where uh, an individual. Um, it, here's what happens a lot, Sean. Is an individual will will have a drug issue, okay, and their lawyer. Their their lawyer will actually cut an excellent deal, but they're they're typically not a not a healthcare lawyer, and and even on in a healthcare fraud case, you know they they get somebody who's a a crackerjack white collar guy, but he doesn't really understand possibly all the nuances of, of healthcare administrative law. And what happens is in this particular case, it happens a lot at the state is they will negotiate no time. And a deferred adjudication, and as long as you stay clean for two years, uh, it's it's that felony is not going to be on your record. Okay, right. The problem is that by statute, the term conviction is so extraordinarily broad that they're going that you know just because you you know when you enter in, into these deferred adjudication agreements you're agreeing that that you did the felony but you're saying but if but the deal is if i stay clean for two years you know you're not you're going to take it off my record too bad they can right. still consider that to be a conviction robert pulled up a case sean recently which is really horrifying it was a a misdemeanor a uh -huh. state court misdemeanor okay what did the felony what and it it involved the plea of guilty was for improper use of a computer now, it was a fact that the underlying, the underlying facts involved a small amount of Medicaid fraud, okay? It never reached the OIG, never reached anybody. A small amount of Medicaid fraud. They worked the deal. They pled guilty to misuse of a computer on a misdemeanor. That went, that went up. They said, no, that is a health care fraud offense, and they used it as a mandatory exclusion and the um, because the that that particular mandatory provision does not require that it be a felony. That's right. And it unbelievable. Was, and and it was affirmed by ALJ not very long ago. So you know, one of the things to know is that you know when people get in trouble, they really have to realize the only deferred prosecution that that can be done is if you've never if there's never any plea. If there, there is can't be a plea. There cannot. So be once a there's a plea, that's it. That's it. You've accepted it. And you've accepted the conviction, even if they wipe your slate clean later on. And a no this is a no low doesn't even count. A no, it doesn't work. That yeah, and this is why it's so critical. I say this all the time, and I know I frustrate people, but I, I, I say it all the time, and I'll say it again. If you work in healthcare and you have an issue, you have to get a healthcare centered attorney. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you can't go and, and get a family court attorney you can't go and get a business real estate attorney 
or something along those lines. Because again, while they may be outstanding attorneys, the 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 world of healthcare is so different than any other industry, and it's so, in my humble opinion, and you guys are the attorney, but the 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 legal system in healthcare is so far beyond what I've seen in other industries so, outside so of maybe nuclear. You know, Sean, I was a, I was actually in a prior life. I did a lot of criminal work. I was a public defender. I was a federal prosecutor. I did that, but I don't do it anymore. And what the problem is, there are very few people with both. And I don't, I don't consider myself both uh, a lawyer and both anymore because I haven't done criminal law in 20 years. So I don't know how to do it anymore. You, and the, the problem is, um, the white collar guys, they don't know healthcare, but folk like us, you know, we're happy to consult, but we're really not, you don't want us in the trenches of a criminal case. I mean, we, yeah, we, we were both at, at, you know, significant positions at the Department of Justice. But the fact is now when it comes to the criminal cases, yes. we always bring in someone who does have, right. criminal healthcare fraud. And, like and, that, and that's the difference, here. right? Right. And that's the difference. And we talk about this all the time. I talk about this with my clients all the time because a lot of them are uninitiated. They they don't understand that a a federal civil case and a federal criminal case are completely different animals. And you know, when 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 I have a federal criminal matter, I'm looking to somebody like a John Pierce or I'm looking to somebody like a um um a Ronald Chapman the second who yeah. are criminal white collar you know uh, uh criminal attorneys so you know it's so important to to understand Mary not just too. yeah it, it's so important not just to understand that you have to have a healthcare centered attorney but you have to have somebody who specializes in civil aspects of the law and those who specialize in the criminal aspect of the law because it's completely different but i want to i want to go back to a couple of things so tell me tell me if i'm right on this okay so some of the services that have been identified by the Office of Inspector General that would be subject to a payment prohibition. And then you guys expound on these. Um, management services, administrative, or any individuals in a leadership role. Talk about that, please. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and, and uh, 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 it's, it's not just managers. It's also, you know, billing and coding. Uh, uh, it's essentially the problem in healthcare is like in most industries, uh, they don't really set it up where you have separate cost points where the funds coming in and the cost being expended, you only segregate it to a, 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 a particular unit. That's not how it works in healthcare or, or any other, or most industries. Okay. So what happens is if you had someone who was excluded, Theoretically, they could work at an organization as long as you could show that you had these systems in place, these walls that right. would prevent federal monies from, from doing that. So uh, essentially anybody that is involved in, in the, in the uh, basket of services, if you right. will, is you've got to screen. But that's just on the staff side. I mean, it gets a little dicier when it comes to contractors and vendors well, and agents. Well, Oops. we'll get there in a minute. So, so tying into that bucket, right? We're talking about people on the surgical support side, yep. um, people who indirectly support care of beneficiaries or patients. As you said, the claims processing, anybody involved in information technology could fall People under the, the, payment the, folks in the cafeteria. The folks in the cafeteria have to be screened. <clears throat> yeah, transportation services, including ambulance dispatchers. Yep. The dispatchers. The um, Sean, selling yeah go ahead please paul what you know and they list in their 2013 this guidance and they start at the very top they start with the manager they say clearly the direct builders right that's obviously right. and but they make a point no it's not just the direct builders and they work their way down the list and they talk about techs and they talk about nurses and they talk about the people in the cafeteria and then they even say and they, their last line is even a volunteer who provides services that are covered in the basket 
of services. So what would that be? Someone in a nursing home, a volunteer in a nursing home. Like a candy striker. Well, anybody. Yeah, somebody That's in the, the hospital at the information desk because they're driving you to different departments. It's That's a right. per diem. Anywhere in a nursing home, for instance, everything is the per diem, on the, uh, right, on the Medicaid side. So anybody, that the, every service you provide is part of that basket. So virtually anybody that walks in there and provides any service, and they also say it's directly or indirectly. So here's the catch. You can't now have someone who's excluded provide, build the, you know, do the, provide the service, and then have a middleman come and then bill for it or sell it to you. Because if you buy that service, right, if you buy that product from someone, they haven't been excluded, but an excluded person created it or provided it, that's the same. You can't have, you can't even have a cutout, someone in the middle as a workaround for that. Right. And that's, and that's why they talk about the direct or indirect exactly. uh, it, it aspect of this. So, so my, my go ahead, Robert. example of indirect, Paul, do you remember that case we saw a few years ago where a physician who, who had, had been excluded, he was properly licensed, okay? Uh, he was seeing Medicare patients, uh, uh, not, in, not billing Medicare, you know, but he was seeing these patients and they were paying him out of pocket, I guess. Uh, and he would write a prescription, okay, which was perfectly legal. It was a perfectly legal prescription. He was properly licensed, not in it. They took the prescription to their local drugstore and their drugstore filled it. Okay. Well, they ended up getting hit with a huge set of our, our CMP because it was written by an excluded physician. So it wasn't considered to be a valid covered. prescription. Yeah, it was invalid because that, that it can't be paid. Um, you know, so that's why. You know, pharmacies and, and all of these d and companies, all of these companies that are um, uh, working with, with, with doctors and even billing companies, if you're getting referrals, for instance, if you're a, a specialist and you're getting a referral from, from a, uh, a, 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 a primary care doc, you better make sure that primary care doc is so, not excluded. So that's, this is a really important point that Robert is making, and that is that, you know, in the world of healthcare, everything, or not everything, but there's there are always referrals and you're always and you have relationships with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Someone's writing someone's making referrals, and the, and those folk, if they are sending you business, if they are sending you patients, and you are, you know, then so as Robert says, the pharmacies have to screen, but you know, if you're a uh, if you're a home health agency and you're getting patients from, you know, from they're not, yeah, because they're writing the order. That's right. And the, so I, I, and the hospital has people that, and it's a perfectly bona fide order. It is a bona fide. Right. So, you know? so I think I think what we talk about really then is is you know uh, for the lawyers that are listening and for others, we're talking about Section eleven twenty eight A of the Social Security Act, right? And it's A one D, right? And basically, what it stipulates is if an excluded individual or entity submits or causes to submit, and I think to me. That's the key language of that entire section. Not whether you submit, but whether or not you cause to be submitted. Well, that is a the claim during the exclusion period. And Say that again. That is the definition of indirect. There you go. There's your indirect because not only are you are you now liable for um, you know criminal uh, 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 liabilities, but now you can also face. Um, you know, liabilities under the CMPs as well, right? Yeah. Well, and, so it's and not I'm just gonna, criminal, it's also the fines attached. You brought up criminal, though, and, and this is so important because there was a case recently, it was either New Jersey or New York, uh, but we've seen several of them in just the last couple of years where a doctor who has gotten his license back, but he's an excluded party, he goes to work for a practice, and the practice knows he's excluded. You know, but they but uh, uh, they take all his services, okay, and they bill them under somebody else's number, someone who is yeah. properly credentialed and is not excluded. Well, now you've taken something that might, you know, subject you to civil monetary penalties, and you've turned it into something that the government's going to go after criminally, and that's what they're doing now. Yeah, I think that when when it, it rolls over to the criminal side, when you know someone is excluded, and you're, you're and you ignore, you're trying to work around that. Well, that's that's what we always talk about. Yeah, that's what we always talk about, right, Robert? You know, yeah. it, it's not it's not the the it's not 
the initial wrongdoing that causes a person to face criminal prosecution is the cover up. <laughs> That's exactly right. Who, who, it's what, exactly right. who left the lights on? Yeah. You know, it's always, I, I mean, it's just crazy. So, you, you, you know, we started talking about vendors, right? So mm-hmm. I want to talk about this because this is one that I think absolutely drives my clients nuts. Um, I, I get calls from them all the time. I got an email from one of my very good friends who I do some work for uh, with their group down in Florida. And the question was, do we really have to screen our vendors? Well, I again, I want to go back to the term must because there's nothing in the statute or the provisions that say you must. But what it says is if you engage with an entity that has excluded employees, you should have known. It's your responsibility and you're not off the hook. But I'm going to leave this to you guys because you're the experts. Yeah, why don't you? So, so it's an interesting issue. So we've wrestled with this, you know, for years, years, and and there is some guidance uh, on this issue. And basically, it you know, it, it it comes down to this: the connection of the vendor to the patient and to the service that you are providing to that patient. So, for instance, as Robert always says, if waste management comes and they they're coming they, into the place. Well, what's if they take the dumpster? They empty your dumpster. They're not involved with the patients. I don't. I would not recommend. I mean, you know, this is not legal, advice, but I don't think that I would say let's. You have to. You need to screen waste management or the driver of that truck. And see, we disagree on that. Well, I you know this, now, but, but but there's a difference between just picking up the dumpster and coming in and emptying those red boxes. I believe. Well, that I agree. I agree. And, the, and I started it by saying, just if we're dealing with the dumpster, I don't think you need to screen that person. Okay. Well, all right. Well, maybe. But I would still do See, not only do our listeners get great information, they get a, they get a sideshow with it, too. I well, love well, having you guys not, on. There, there is no cut and dry answer to some No, of there isn't. I understand. So you, so you now tell people to screen the dumpster driver? If they're, well, I don't know. They're maybe coming in and empty yeah, the trash. Yeah, coming in on my He's filthy. Well, still. <laughs> Well, first of all, <laughs> he's filthy. It's a continuum. What about the phone company? On the one hand, you've got Verizon. Okay. I was just going to bring up Verizon okay. or the phone company. You what about UPS or FedEx? You don't have to check Verizon. You don't have to check the electric company. You don't have to require them to give you something that shows that they screen. Okay. That's on the one end. Okay. Then but what about two. UPS or FedEx? If we're having to, if we're on, a, think about this. If we're on a prepayment review with mm-hmm. a, a with a payer, and we are having to submit our claims hard copy with the documentation attached, right? Because that's part of the requirement of a prepayment review. If we're giving these packets of information that impacts our ability to be paid by a federal payer oh. program, let's just say Medicare. Do we have a responsibility to now say to UPS because you're transporting our claims information and medical record information? You know, we have answer, to screen you guys. You know, here's my my answer. My answer. I may have a different answer because uh, often we don't answer. always agree. In fact, a lot of times we don't agree. Yeah, my, but that's my, how we get to the better. My answer would be that you know, think about it this way: the waste management, the dumpster driver, no, but the guy who comes in and collects the boxes, the red box, the shark, the shark container, yep. that's yep. different. That's yes, okay. Let's think yep. about it. that's the continuum, right? Okay. Where is this? And so the FedEx guy or the UPS guy, I mean, we're screening to ensure to to protect against risk to patients and to the federal fisc. That's the goal. I don't think that they pose a risk to either factor. And, and, and I would argue that they're no different, ultimately, than USPS. Right. I, I, right. And nobody okay. requires USPS so, to screen. So, so, so let's talk about some of these potential vendors, right? So information technology, definitely yes. need to screen them. No Ambulance question. and other transportation service providers, yes? yes? How about if we go through a checklist and you say yes or no? Okay. All right. Maybe. <laughs> I'll take the babies. How about medical equipment suppliers? 
It I, depends. I say yes. All medical. Yes. I say I would. You know, I don't think say, if you're um, who's the the largest ones that are. Well, they contribute to the overall uh, basket of services. Right. Any kind of medical equipment is going to be for a patient. But I don't think I don't think that you have to screen the casting, for instance. That no, but I think that you probably ought to ask McKesson if they screen. Yeah. And, and, That's and a great point. Attention. Okay, yeah. because you can't screen McKesson. But I would still take the position, hey, McKesson, do you screen? Because your services and your products, we're going to be billing Medicare for them, or they're included in our overall cost. Therefore, yes, you have to. And as a practical matter, because it's going to say, I'm not giving you anything. Go get some. Go get it from Sedan. So but I think, I think the argument, if I'm hearing this correctly, the argument would be if something came up during an investigation with McKesson and they came to our organization, we would at least have a paper trail to be able to say, look, there's nothing that mandates we have to screen these individuals or these companies, but. We have inquired with McKesson, and McKesson basically, and, and I'm not saying McKesson would do this. Right, I'm just, right, right. you guys use their name. But McKesson told us to go pound sand. We're not giving you anything. Yeah. Have we, have we potentially covered our self? I think that you've taken every reasonable step you can take. But I think a, a good example also, and this is something also to kind of keep in mind. Let's say, for instance, that a nursing home uh, commits health care fraud, a chain or a pharmaceutical company, manufacturing company. You'll notice all the time you see these places and they may take a plea, but if you actually look into it, they're not really, that big organization is not taking the plea. 99 times out of 100, they've got some shell organization that's taking the plea because if they were to take the plea, they would be excluded. It'd be a mandatory exclusion. Right. It'd be a mandatory exclusion. Right. So, you know, I hate to say this, but the big guys get away with a lot more than the little guys who get the short end of the stick pretty much every time. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. So, okay, so we, we said maybe for the medical equipment suppliers, Robert, you say yes. Food service workers, potentially. Absolutely. Lab technicians, Yes. I would think so. Pharmacists, I would think so. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Outside billers and coders, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Third party billing companies, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think even your lawyers, they're lawyers they need to be checking. They absolutely. We screen. Especially lawyers. Okay. So, Sean, Sean, there's, yes. there's a flip on this is that the. For in the in the advantage plans and the Medicare Advantage plan. So they they're so the um, the plans have an obligation to screen, which they then push down to their first level um, obligation. So they push the obligation down, and they have they require the hospitals and the various the uh, providers to them, who then push down. So you so in other words, you end up having people uh, at the bottom. We get clients now who are getting letters from Aetna, who are getting letter from you know from very regular from the yeah. plan. And, and that wants proof that you're screening. And they actually right. are required to obtain that proof. Yeah. So that actually, just sliding off this topic for two seconds, this now goes back to ACA and the requirement of an OIG corporate compliance program, which has actually been in place since 2010. That's right. It is a requirement to have an OIG corporate right. compliance program. I mean, prior to 2010, I mean, you and I both know OIG. Right. You got to give OIG. I give them a lot of credit. Okay. Yeah. I've been, in, I've been in healthcare a long time since 1984. I got a master's in hospital administration before I was a federal prosecutor. And when I was in hospital management, nobody even knew what a compliance officer was. There was only That's risk right. management. That's all there was. OIG, to their credit. In, in 97 and 98, really put together this push for these, these uh, suggested uh, compliance plans for these different ends. And now you look around and everybody from oil and gas to banking has a compliance oh, yeah. officer. Yeah. But to, to the point, this is, I, I look at this, right, as because we haven't seen the level of enforcement that I think would force people to make this mandatory in their organizations. I think organizations that create a culture of compliance, right, um, where it's from the top down and, you know, they have effective policies and procedures, you know, but I still go back to what I just said a moment ago. It is mandatory 
that if a physician participates with Medicare and or Medicaid, that they have a OIG corporate compliance program. The problem, the problem is, excuse me, we just haven't had enforcement on that. And that's why most people say it's voluntary. It's not voluntary under ACA. Sean, you know what? Yeah, please. I'm gonna if we could take a little detail. Yeah, let's get back yeah. on the curve. Well, or just up for a second and something yeah. slightly different. And and Robert had mentioned it's something Robert said. He said, you know, when he was back in the dark ages, when he was a hospital administrator, you know, and he would drive a little buggy and the horse to, to the hospital and oh, yeah, I forgot my leech. Um anyway, back way back um back then. Risk, but it was it was all insurance and it was all risk right. management. So I got involved in enterprise in the concept of enterprise risk management for a bit, and and it's and it's interesting that in in healthcare there's still this kind of this split between like compliance and insurance, you know, right? And then, and so, but enterprise risk management is the concept of, you know, this is really one and the same thing. You Insurance is protecting at risk after the fact. Compliance is trying to stop it before the fact. Why do we have two silos? Why aren't we one? And when you look at healthcare, it is unique as an industry in that all of the risks are internal. They are the people, really. You know, we're not worried so much about hurricanes and so forth. Well, we are, but, you know, those aren't the, you know, supply chain and all that kind of stuff. Our risks are our people. And when you think about what gets somebody excluded, drugs, patient abuse, healthcare fraud, these are the people you don't want on your staff. I and agree. so I try and explain to people, you know, looking at it, don't ask me. You know, how many dollars it might cost me if or, what, you know, what's my cost? Look at who, look at, do you want these people on your staff? And this is a really important aspect of, of screening. You don't, they just pose a risk to your patients, to your financial best interest and to your practice or whatever it is that you have. And that's really, you know, if you think about it, right, what are the risks that you have? It's, it's all malpractice. It's this, it's that. It's all in your people. And that's really what this does. At least it, it eliminates a, a group of people. I know that some of them are probably on that that should, on the list that shouldn't be. That you know, there's nothing we can do. But but the OIG said you can't use them. And at one time they weren't. And this is it. And so this is a, this is an important thing for people to understand. You just don't. You were screaming to keep people off your staff. You don't want them on there. No, I agree with you 100. percent um, now let let me let me shift now to the states because we've been talking about the federal and we've been talking about the fact that from a federal standpoint, there's there's no mandate, right? There's guidance and there's recommendations and there's you should have. But let's here's, here's what's going to happen to you if you don't. Right, and here's what <laughs> here's the potential, you know, back you know backlash if you don't. I, mm -hmm. Right. Let's transition to the states because the states, I think, are inherently different. And I think that's where the biggest risk comes into play. So can you, can you gents, talk about the state requirements? And sure. Again, I think it's, what, 36 states that have these requirements, if I'm not mistaken? Oh, everybody, you know. They, everybody, they've all got exclusion requirements, but they yeah. don't all have databases. About 40, to search. 42 or 43 have their own exclusion lists. Those that don't can rely on the LEIE, the, the OIG's list. But they do have the states. First of all, every um, every state has a, with their provider agreements, typically, stay, often, not all, but very many, and it didn't say that you certify or you swear or you affirm that none of your employees or vendors or contractors are excluded. Some of them say or have ever been. But you are affirming to that, mm -hmm. and that that none of your employees, vendors, and contracts are excluded on your provider agreement. That's and, number one. And, and it's very similar to CMS and the Advantage plans. Here we're talking about CMS and the states, because remember, with Medicaid, anywhere from fifty to eighty percent or so is typically paid by the feds, and the feds tell the states 
you know, as a condition of us paying this, you have to ensure well, that these people aren't excluded. So it's very interesting that the, the rules for the, for the states and Medicaid are always often, are often much more difficult than they are for Medicare, which is something to think about. Yeah. This, the states are required to, to make sure that none of their, none of the managing people are involved or, or their relations. But most states have extended that obligation to even include all of your employees. That's number one. So if you take a dollar of Medicaid, if you're a Medicaid provider, then you've signed an agreement with your state, probably swearing that you don't have any. That's number one. Number two, right. there are states, there are states in which it is a crime. It Louisiana. Is, it is a crime to use uh, to uh, submit a claim or an app or, or be involved with someone who is excluded. And an individual who was um, there, there was an individual who was excluded. He stopped practicing. He was started doing a medical billing practice. He worked with that, and they said that was sufficient, and they prosecuted him. So, yeah. and that's not, and, and there are a number of states where it's actually a crime. So. Yeah, when it comes to the states, it really is the Wild West. But the bottom it line is, you have to be screening. And that's why it's so important, though, that providers not just screen for the LEIE and the SAM, but they also ought to be screening all the state databases every 30 days. Okay. So, let, let, let me, let's start to put a bow on this thing. Um, so, I think one of the most important things that I'm taking away from this is if I have a corporate compliance program and I claim to be in compliance with the federal payer programs and other state payer programs and commercial payers, whatever it is, whether it's the MAOs, MCOs. It flows down. That's right. It flows down. I need to have, if I'm hearing you guys correctly, I need to have policies and or procedures in place that at least speak to the fact we are making a bona fide effort to ensure we are not employing anybody who has been excluded, irrespective of whether it's mandatory or permissive. It doesn't matter. We need to be able to demonstrate. This. So we can either do that via our own methodology, right, of using the SAM or the LEIE or going to the states to um, figure out you know, if an individual is excluded or not, which I can see that taking hours and being treacherous work, or they can engage with an entity like exclusion screening, where they come to an organization like exclusion screening, and that entity gets a list each month of all of the employees of all of the vendors of that organization, and then your entity, Paul, right? Because you're the managing director of exclusion screen. Right. Your entity goes through and does all that. Can you talk quickly about how you all screen and what your process is and, and really what the the end user gets as a uh, deliverable? Sure, happy to. So we develop a, our state and federal exclusion registry, which is the acronym for SAFER. And our SAFER, it's a, it's a proprietary system where basically we have all of the state databases. We have the uh, LEIE, the OIG's list. We have the GSA SAM, which was with the SAM, you know, sometimes you'll see EPLS or something like that. The SAM is a, is a collection of all of the older debarment lists. So, right. and so you've got, so we've got the GSA SAM, we've got the LEIE, we've got all of the states. We also include in that OFAC and a number of other uh, exclusion databases because people may need them, uh, may, may need them or may not, it just depends. And so it's very, very simple. We have a template, you put it, you, um, you know, we actually have API integration so that we, if, if we can integrate that way and then it's automatic, it's great then it goes whoop, whoop, back and forth. I don't understand any of that, but there it is. Um, or you know, or you do, or they, you know, they you just submit an Excel spreadsheet and uh, it comes in, we screen, you get a report at the end of the month. The report says, these are all of the databases we screen. Nobody is excluded. There may on occasion be someone who is in what we call in yellow, which means we need some further uh, identification. We need some further information. We're checking with the state because whereas it's easy to verify with the OIG, 
you just send in, you, but it's not always easy with some of the states, but you get a report back. It says what we've done. You've done nothing. Sometimes we even have some older clients that send in a, a PDF with the names of their now, now, Paul, nobody, Paul, nobody keeps these reports. What if a provider comes to you and says, I need proof that I've done this for the last three years. Yeah. My insurance company requires it. My payers require it. Medicare requires Medicare it. Medicare requires it. And we and I didn't keep any of those reports you sent. And, and so our clients have a portal which they can go in and those, the, all of the reports they've ever had have been stored in the portal. Also, we've got them in the, if they, if they don't have it, if they can't, you know, get access to their portal or whatever we have, we maintain the reports. Uh, I think we remain them 10 years, if not longer. I, uh, okay. it's, so we have them forever. So it's a total solution. It's a standalone uh, program that you all have. They could either send you a PDF and you figure out how to get it in the system or, they upload it through either an Excel file or a CSV8 file or some other mechanism that allows your system to communicate with theirs. And the cost, the cost of doing it for any physician practice is, I, I guarantee any physician, it's never as much as the water that they pay in their um, in their room, in their waiting rooms. For nineteen ninety five, you too can have an exclusion yeah. screen in your practice. Now, um, uh, it literally, I mean, literally, I did an analysis once. I tried to figure out how much it would cost to get the water in each one for, and and we're always less than that. It really is, I think, <laughs> the most significant compliance risk that nobody's ever heard of, because most of the people that I represent, when I'm dealing with these cases. They weren't even aware of their obligation until a key, t you know, I mean, keep in until mind. Until a key TAM or an investigation well, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, just very quickly. Remember how I told you that, that even if you're doing it every 30 days, you can avoid the CMPs, but it's still an overpayment? Well, That's once right. it's an overpayment, of course, if you don't promptly report and return that money, what happens to overpayment, Sean? You know, like Jesus turning water into wine turns into well, a violation a reverse of the false claim. Yeah, a reverse false claim. That's right. And, and, you know, one of the things that we also do is that, that so there are other services and you and everybody should shop. And, and that's always, you know, that's the way of the world. But, you know, always make sure you're doing apples to apples because we, we screen and we verify. And some services just kind of let you have access to. Yeah, them. we don't give you a list of or exclusive. They don't give you a list of says. Here's 20 people. You really ought to check into these. Right. So we, we fully verify it um, and make sure that, you know, we do whatever it takes to make sure. Because, you know, here's the thing. Robert and I started exclusion screening. I mean, this, this was like, this, this was, um, this is healthcare lawyers who looking at a client who didn't know what to do and we perceived a need. As opposed to every, all of our competitors, everybody out there is a tech company. Yeah. And, and I remember I remember when this thing was first introduced uh, more than a decade ago, we were at a PMI conference somewhere in Texas. And I remember Robert talking about this. So, well, yeah, I mean, tech. this program has been around. Right. And it's not tech. It's we come at it from a compliance perspective. Yeah, completely compliance. Because we're compliance. Though. And that's what it's supposed to be from a legal and regulatory standpoint. And this is just one other way that clients can cover their assets. All right. So I have a bunch of takeaways from this. Uh, number one, obviously, you got to maintain compliance. Uh, understand what the federal statutes are, what your obligations under those federal statutes are versus what are your mandatory requirements under the states? Because there are some inherent differences between those. Um, understand that, you know, failure to do your diligence and to uh, make something that is a reportable situation, such as employing somebody who has been excluded, failing to report that through a potential self-disclosure protocol and maintaining that money becomes a potential overpayment to the organization, which could result in a reverse false claim. You also run the potential of a criminal investigation and or criminal prosecution if you employ individuals um, who were excluded, but then found their way back into the system by doing something a little bit different under a different tax ID number. There's the bottom line is there's both criminal and civil penalties that an entity could potentially face for engaging with being an individual that was excluded and then trying to weasel your way back into the system. Um, 
and it trickles all the way down potentially to the candy striper of your organization at who is a voluntary person. Um, I know know, it's a stretch, but it's there. And, you know, when you try and fix it, one last thing, I don't know that we we mentioned briefly is, and that is when making the disclosure is like all things in healthcare, it's complicated. That's right. right. Robert's done a bunch of these and there's, you know, most of them, most of them uh, uh, involve a proxy calculation of the damages because they're not a direct biller. You know, going, you you never want to go to the OIG unless you really have to. There are ways around it and and Robert, and so it's really important to find someone that is, uh, if you've made that mistake, to find someone like him that knows his way around and knows how to, to try and resolve it. It's not, we've seen people go into OIGs and really make some bad decisions out of it. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I tell this to clients all the time. Uh, an OIG self-disclosure should always be your last option. <laughs> right. Exhaust every option prior to. And it's not because I have anything. I love working with the Office of Inspector General. I have friends at the OIG. One of my very good friends, Eric Rubenstein, is a retired special agent from the uh, OIG. So, you know, but it is a painful process. It's an expensive process, and it could be a laborious process. So find somebody to Paul's point, as he was saying, like Robert Lyles, who does these on a regular basis, who's navigated these treacherous waters and who can ensure a more positive outcome than you finding somebody who handled your last real estate deal or your fourth divorce. So with that (laughs) said, I want to thank Paul and Robert, um, for both being on Paul Weidenfeld, uh, managing director of exclusion screen LLC. I will make sure that I post a direct link to their entity, uh, in the, uh, sub notes for the podcast. Uh, also to Robert Lyles, managing partner of Lyles Parker out of Washington, DC. They also are a nationwide law firm, uh, have locations down in, uh, Texas and in Louisiana. Um, and I'm sure they're uh, thinking about some other areas. Uh, I think you've uh, started looking at California, haven't you? We do. We have an, we have an attorney out there, and we're thinking That's right. about expanding there. That's right. I've had the pleasure to work with her. All right. So, again, on behalf of myself, Sean Weiss, a.k.a. The Compliance Guy, and on behalf of the entire team here at The Compliance Guy Live, I want to thank each and every single one of you again for tuning in, logging on, and just hanging out with me and my good friends today as we talked about OIG exclusions and what it means to you and what you need to do to make sure that you're not one of the sad stories that gets published in social media. Until next time, take care of yourself, but remember, be good to others. Take care. Good night.